of what is actually um, happening in the room. How much do you take in and process consciously? And then secondly, of that, how much do you retain? How much do you retain? Like, And we know that retention is a diminishing um, equation, right? Like, you might retain stuff over the next um, uh, five minutes, and then a little bit less after two hours, and a little bit less after 24 hours. And then if we came back and quizzed on it in two weeks, how much of what we talk about here is actually going to be something that you will remember. So, hearing and listening is important. It's one of the five senses. It's part of what constitutes our reality. Right? Um, and particularly as we were talking about last week in, in language and uh, how culture rides over the back of language and that language requires, um, language exists within this, uh, it's a process of which we talk about what is real, right? So when we think of grammar, grammar talks about, by and large, it's a mirror of what is, what is actually true in the real world. Now, humans have this unique capacity not only to talk about what is real um, in the real world, what is actual, what exists in the real world, but we also talk about ideals, right? What we would like to be in the real world. Um, we talk about um, goals, we talk about wishes, we talk about, you know, futures, and that's something that no other creature in creation can actually do. Um, but we're not going to, we're not focusing on that so much right now, but when you study grammar, you know, you learn about declarative sentences, they declare what is true in the real world. Um... When you learn about linking verbs, right? Um, William Carey is a research university. As we've um, worked out in, in debate at times, you know, when you're defining a proposition with the verb is, that has to be something that is true in the real world, right? So that language is talking about what is true in the real world. The only way we can perceive that, or one of the ways, one of the few factors that we have, we perceive with our eyes, we perceive with our ears, with our, and we feel with our hands, right? And then we smell what we smell with our nose, or we taste with our, with our mouth. So we have uh, these five senses. I would argue that what you see and what you hear are two of the most important. Right? Um, it has been proven, um, and this isn't, uh, I, I don't mean this at all in any way detrimental to someone who has this disability, but people who are deaf and have a problem hearing, their ability to actually develop high level uh, communication is handicapped, and that's that's just empirically um, the case. So being able to hear is extremely important. Now, so as we're thinking about hearing, um, do we listen to what we hear? That's the question that we're kind of contemplating. First off, and in thinking about that, let me take it a little bit in a little bit different uh, direction here. This is probably uh, something that may be familiar to some of you, but um, it's, it's a biblical story. And 
and it comes from a book of the Bible called um, Kings. And in this book, uh, in this story, in First Kings chapter eighteen, um, we have the story of a man who has served God for many years, but is experiencing um, some level of depression. Uh, let me share it with you. Let's see where we go. Where is the oh in context? So Elijah um, has just had a, a showdown with some bad guys, some some, some false prophets. And he's physically exhausted. Um, the world started to rain right after it had been uh, a, 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 an absence of water for over three years. And now it's just starting to rain. And then he gets a, a life threat, a threat on his life. Um, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran from his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Um, so he feels the need to cut ties, right? To protect the people who may be connected to him. Um, he goes on alone. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree and he asked that he might die. So he's so dejected. Um, so I'm not going to say he is suicidal, even though that's, um, you know, potential. He definitely is so despairing that he wants to die. He's not willing to take his own life, right? But he does feel like he has no purpose to live any longer. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a broom tree. An angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And so he's he's traveled, he's alone, he's borderline suicidal, and he wants to sleep all the time. Right? This classic example of depression. Uh, he looked and behold there was at his head a cake um, baked on hot stones in a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. So he's basically doing nothing but eating and, and sleeping at this point. Angel of the Lord came again a second time, touched him and said, Arise, eat, for the journey is too great for thee. And he rose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food. Forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the man of God. So he ate two times, and from there he was... Um, He traveled for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes to the mountain where God used to speak to Moses, right, Mount Horeb. And he came into a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel forsaken with your covenant, threw down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life and take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he's using his same reasoning that he's been using, right? But here's a picture of Elijah had to be in the right place, in the right attitude to hear God. 
And God wasn't necessarily in the noise. He wasn't in the wind, and he wasn't in the earthquake, and he wasn't in the fire. And all those things um, were very, could be very distracting, right? If you think about it, he's going back, and he wants God to talk to him just like God talked to Moses. How did God talk to Moses? God showed up in a burning bush, right? In the fire. Right there on the same mountain, Mount Horeb. What else? God showed up in a great wind that opened up the Red Sea so that the people could walk across. Right? God showed up on Mount Horeb with an earthquake whenever he gave the Ten Commandments. Three ways that God had already spoken to Moses. And Elijah was listening for those three ways. And God didn't speak to him in any of those three ways. God spoke to him in a unique way. And Elijah had to be in a position where he could hear God speak to him. Yeah, God can speak in, in any way he wants to. At any time he wants to. But in this case, Elijah had to be willing to, he had to have the proper attitude to listen to God however God chose to speak to him. One other scripture I want to use, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. This is one of my favorite verses. Uh, if you'll allow me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in an older translation, the King James translation. Um, I just like it the way it says it. I know. I'm going to try to help you. Um, yeah, uh, I could do that too. <laughs> but it says, God at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So, sundry times, divers manners. That just means a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. Many different ways, over a lot of different, uh, a lot of different times. There wasn't a pattern. If you're trying to look for a pattern, God breaks the mold every time. God doesn't do the same thing twice in a row, does he? He doesn't speak to each one of us the same way every time. Um, over the years, he's spoken many different ways at many different points. And he says, in these last days, he spoke to us by his son. So Jesus is what? He's the speaking of God. You could even say he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? So... Our being in a position in which we can hear what God has to say is important. Now, what are some of the things that keep us from hearing? All right, what are some of the things that keep us from hearing? Talking. Yeah. Talking definitely is one of them. Um, I don't know if we're... Say what? Disagreeing with someone. Disagreeing makes you not hear, not yeah, listen? Yeah, a lot of times you don't listen to people. Like so you kind of, of just block them out? Yeah. Uh -huh. Physical distractions? Other noises? You know, when you're trying to listen to a particular sound and then like five other people are talking at the same time, it's really hard to say, okay, I wanted to listen to that, that, that voice. Or uh, I, was, I need to say like uh, unexpected hostility. Unexpected hostility? Like when so how does unexpected make it, make it different? Because like, let's say you're talking to somebody and you're like, you're being disrespectful and they're like out of the blue. What you were once focused on, you're no longer hearing and listening. Yeah, so that like that jump in blood pressure makes you 
like lose focus on the on the fine details and just like you're in fight or flight mode at that point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so they talk about external noises and internal noises, internal states of our own mind or mental capacity to hear. And external noises being um, Why is that not showing? I don't understand. That. It's like it's not it's not registering. There it is. Finally. Okay. So external noises and internal noises. Um so I like to think of this in the terms of divided and undivided attention. Divided and undivided attention. And how many times are we actually able to give undivided attention? I'm just talking about in, in real world, everyday life. Okay, so there is a social structure that, that brings you to a point of undivided attention, right? Like church. Yeah. Maybe classes. It's not a guarantee in classes. Mm -hmm. What about like music in the morning? Like in the bathroom? You got undivided attention for what? To accomplish what you have to accomplish in that work. So you're focused like get to the restroom? Correct. Okay. I mean, there's things along the way that can distract you. Like, there's no way to give it 100%, but, you know, you'll give majority of your attention to one thing. You might have a few, like, squirrel moments, but... Right. So I'm not, I'm not saying that as a, as a... I'm not getting down on you about it. I'm just saying, you know, real world, what is it like? What is life like? It's right? very distracting, especially, like, today, because we have, like... We like quick videos and like quick snippets from like interaction pictures. Uh huh. So we're always distracted by something. Even if we so we have a um, we have like a TikTok attention span, right? Um, I didn't know you knew what that was. Let me just say, I want to pass this class. TikTok <laughs> attention span. Um, and this is just real world, all right? Um, in, for those of you that took my uh, speech 101, we talk about in, in like third week, we talk about what I call triage of information. I'm fixing to explain it. Um, the triage of information, uh, our society <laughs> is built on the transfer of information to such a degree, all right? We stay plugged into our devices. We stay plugged into our phones, we, uh, through the internet, through t television, through radio. We constantly have this input of information into us. You know, there, there's not a, uh, well, hopefully there's some time in, in each day that y'all take a break from the inundation of information, but it's just a part of the structure of our life that we have this constant, and I would say that it's larger over the last 30 years than it has ever been in the history of the world. Um, information, we have these huge information pipelines, you know, that is the internet, and it's really hard, or we have to learn very quickly how to triage that information. How um, a triage is like a decision: what is important, what is life critical, and what is not. Right? It's like um, it's like a nurse in the emergency room. You come in, and they have to decide: okay, 
You know, if he's bleeding out, then that's the most important thing, even though he may have miter scrapes and scratches all over his body. Where, you know, where the artery is, that's the most important thing. If he can't breathe, you know, you can only last three or four minutes without oxygen. So that's where we have to focus is get, getting um, oxygen into his lungs, right? So that triage focuses on the most vital things. And as um, members of this society, that's what we learn early on is this triage of information. And what it does is it starts, we start building in these coping mechanisms in which we ignore a lot of noise, right? A lot of information, a lot of voices we learn to ignore. And, that, and that's, that's just part of existence, right? We learn to ignore. Um, and it's essential for our health and our, our mental well-being in some senses. Um, we know if, if, if you... Um, I've had um, family members who have gone through uh, therapy, and one of the first things they say is you have to build good um, walls of differentiation, right? Know um, which voices to listen to and which voices to ignore, especially negative voices, and of voices that tear you down. Um, those are the kind of voices. And so we, so this is part of the reality of life, right? And so we have to retrain ourselves to say, okay, what are voices that we need to listen to? What are voices that we need to pay attention to? And we have to be intentional in this process of listening to these voices. Sometimes the, um, the voices of uh, the, the misunderstanding comes because of lack of understanding. Um, I had this experience. I had a, a young man uh, join our school this year. Uh, I'm talking about the high school where I teach. Um, it came from another school, and he felt that he was inadequate in my language class. I teach Latin. And so his coping mechanism was basically to sleep through class. I'm not saying it was the best coping mechanism. You know, it's hard to catch on and catch up if you're sleeping. But that was his first reaction because of the jargon, right? Because of the foreign nature of the language. And like you talked last week, whenever you are preparing yourself to enter into a new work culture, they have their own vocabulary, they have their own language, and you have to enter into this, um, this experience with a learning attitude. You have to enter in with uh, recognizing, you know, a, a certain amount of humility, say, hey, I've got a lot to learn, I'm coming in with my ears open. You know, and so in a sense, you're opening up your ears, you're opening up those gates of information, and you're letting a lot more dump in than you normally would. You're less selective, right? Whenever I'm going into a new language, I do that, right? If I'm, if I'm going to learn a new language, if I'm going to start learning Arabic, right, then I start going to the Arabic restaurant and listening to the Arabic music videos that they play, right? And I start talking to the Arabic guys, um, I start getting um, like an audio version of the Quran and, and just kind of listening, listening to the flow. Um, I can start going on Al Jazeera and listening to the news in Arabic. I can watch a soap opera in Arabic, right? And, and start all these different styles of language all start flowing in. And they don't make any sense to me early on, but... I'm allowing this language to kind of inundate and our brains are really amazing at being able to restructure, reprogram themselves to, to recognize patterns and start adapting and making sense out of the information that we're getting. And so putting ourselves in that position of openness and acceptance, allowing that information to restructure and reprogram our brains to where we know we recognize it, 
We understand it. It begins to make sense. It begins to gain some importance in our life. And we are able to then um, become a part of that community, a part of that culture. And so that's really important to be able to learn to listen. Um, going back to the, the communication model, remember, you have the speaker, you have the receiver. They're sending, oh, pardon me, they're sending a message over a channel. Uh, so being open to that channel. Um, and in some ways, um, learning how to dial in, um, even with accepting many, many different forms of communication and learning the new language, you still have to have some sense of, okay, what exactly do I need to learn? You know, there, there are some specific types of information that you need, some survival skills, right? And we're adults, we're smart enough to figure out, okay, I am going to need this, 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 and this. And so we can intentionally start looking for that kind of information. Misinterpreting inadequate processes. Um, these these slides will be up on the um, up on the uh, canvas later. Failing to be an active listener. Three types of listening: passive, active. Um, we're listening preferences or styles, people oriented. All right. So let's talk about. What kinds of intentional actions can we take to improve our ability to listen, to hear? Um, we talked about already that, um, well, the book actually stated that only 25 to 50% of what we hear is retained. Sometimes subconsciously we might hear things and actually retain it. You know, that, that happens, right? Especially, I don't know if y'all have ever had this experience where you're walking in an airport and they start calling your name. Like, you hear thousands of voices buzzing all around you, and you're just kind of blocking it out, and then all of a sudden you hear your name come out over the loudspeaker. It's like, what, what, what? Señores y señoras pasajeras. All right. Um... All right, um, let me read you an example here. From the book. Miguel had a successful career as an event planner. He started off as an assistant with an agency, but through hard work and consistent results, he had developed his own client list and saved enough money to start a company of, out of his home. He specialized in weddings and took pride in helping couples plan their dream event. As his client base continued to grow due to word of mouth referrals, he struggled to keep up with all the client requests, but did not have the funds to hire additional employees. Miguel found himself multitasking on most days and he was often double booked. The summer months were especially hectic. One of his repeat clients, Tamara, hired him to plan a 50th anniversary party for her parents as she had been so pleased with how her wedding turned out. 
It was an especially important event because Tamara's father had been diagnosed with cancer a few months before. A few weeks before the party, Miguel was meeting with a new client when the phone rang. Tamara was on the phone, extremely upset because they needed to move up the event due to a medical procedure scheduled around the original event date. Miguel took the call while working with the new client. While showing the new client fabric samples and play settings, he listened to Tamara and assured her he would take care of it, and they agreed on an available date. On the day of the event, Tamara, Miguel, and her parents and their guests arrived at the venue to find that another event had already begun. Miguel was mortified when he realized that he had forgotten to reschedule the event with the venue. Although he attempted to apologize and offered alternatives, the damage was irreparably done. The family was extremely upset. Tamara was crying, called Miguel an insulting name, and told him that she would be sure to tell her friends and acquaintances about the experience. Can you see the picture here? Just from a purely, um, uh, what do you call it? From a purely professional point of view, that would be unacceptable. And it is going to affect your life and your ability to, um, to get work. Right. So it's something that you have to consider. And I don't know what um, what the solution is. One is, um, so one of the solutions I would say is to set boundaries. This is hard, especially when um, you have multiple conflicting responsibilities. Right? Multiple conflicting responsibilities. But you have to learn to set some kind of boundaries. You have to, um, you have to put in some, some kind of structure that's going to make you um, responsible. Or a structure for success. That's what I want to say. Structure for success. So, what kinds of what kinds of habits do you have for active listening? Or um, actively retaining information. What kind of habits do you have? Yeah. <laughs> For discussion. Um, I don't even look at somebody in the eye because that helps me hear what they say. And retention of information. Um, for me personally, what I'll do is I'll put like two or three things they said say that stand out, and I can remember like everything they said from start to finish word for word. What I do is I take the most important words of every sentence throughout the conversation. So you focus on keywords or focus on key moments that help you solidify the memory. Yeah, the kinds that make you go, ah, I can say that. That's that's good. Um, there are types of memory tricks that people can employ to remember important things. Those of you who have perhaps memorize long speeches or performances, you have to figure out ways of remembering a, a lot of information. You know, um, I know that the old orators from ancient Rome used to talk about picturing a room, mm -hmm. right? And putting information on different walls and different furniture in the room. And then they can like, in their mind's eye, they can go to that, to that room and see that. We have a very famous example, like in uh, Sherlock, where he has the mind, his mind palace, and he'll go down, down the steps into his mind palace, and 
go through these mental filing cabinets. And they don't exist, but in his mind, he can see going to this filing cabinet and pulling out this information. And there's, and there's that information there. So that's important. Having kind of memory tricks. Looking people in the eye and using memory tricks. I use the, tr I use the word trick. I don't mean to use that in any way derogatory. It just, mean, it's just a mean like memory strategy. strategy. There you go. There you go. What else, what else do you use? Uh, repetition. Repetition. Muscle memory. You say it over and over and over and over and over again. You know, something going to stick. Okay. So you're meeting a new customer for the first time. Never met them before. How are you going to use repetition to remind, to remember something? At that point, I wouldn't use repetition. I would actually use uh, visual uh, picture memorization, which I would focus on everything around me and the things they're saying. And the things they say based off of what's around me, I'll picture everything all together. And that's where memory comes back. Okay. Like right now, today, like you're teaching. Next week, I'll be able to remember what you said and how you said it. Because of the way you're standing, what you wear on the backboard right there, and what's on the projector right here. Um, do any of y'all use repetition? Would any of you use repetition with a customer? Well, it depends on if they're like a, a, like a repeat customer. Like, let's say you have somebody that comes into a pizza parlor, they order the same order every single day. You have no choice but to remember what they order because they order it every single day or every single week, whether it's once a week or twice a week. Okay, let me give you an example where repetition might work. Most people, um, this is a, some statistics from LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is this idea that you are basically anywhere from three to five connections from any person in the world. Three to five connections. That's hard to believe. Like if... You know someone who knew someone who knows someone who knows someone to the fifth level to every person in the world. I know a guy at the yoga class. Seven billion people within five levels of you. Now, can we remember all those people's names? No. So, but... It, we are amazingly equipped to remember many people's names. Oh, really? Um, and we have to use these kind of strategies to try to maximize our Rolodex. Maximize the connections that we have. Um, first of all, by giving importance to each, to each connection that we have. Recognizing who they are, why they're important, um, valuing them as a person and for what they, you know, for what they do and what they know. And whenever I meet someone, they tell me their name. We, talk, we chat for a second, you know, that little icebreaker. I again ask them their name. Uh, I'm sorry, can you tell me your name again? Repetition, right? They tell me again. Then I use their name at least twice. So, Chris, um, you know, the, so you know, it, it, we have these things in common. And then in a minute, I will use their name again. Yeah, Chris, thank you for that. And so, by asking them the second time their name, and then by repeating their name back to them, first of all, you are giving them that respect. You know, that their name is important. Their name is valuable. Well, their name is um, their personhood, you know. And secondly, that repetition helps solidify in your mind who they are and um, what their name is. So I agree that repetition is a great strategy for potentially um, being able to... Um, uh, work, uh, learn from people. A couple other st um, strategies 
that I see y'all are already using. One is taking notes. Taking notes. Writing things down. Right? Writing things down. Um, the, uh, one of my early teachers, whenever I was um, an intern in, in, in missions, he said, he, he used this expression here. I'm, I'm fixing to erase this if y'all are done and write something else. He would say, get all you can and can all you can get. Get all you can and can all you can get. So you have to have a way of taking notes. Now, it's fine to take notes. But part of the problem is, can you actually read your own notes like a week from now? That's a, a rhetorical question. You can answer if you want to. Sometimes I can't read my own notes. Like, like I can read the words, but it's like, they're so telegraphic. I wrote a few keywords down and I was like, what was I thinking? What did I mean by putting those words there together? Um, and... I mean, I, I have taken this to heart a lot. I have um, probably about uh, four um, filing cabinets full of old notebooks, just full of notes, all the way back from high school. I mean, I still have a lot of uh, my notes from high school. Things that I learned then that, I, that have become a foundation um, sometimes. The thing is, we learn so much by analogy that if you can retain what you've learned, then it helps you to learn faster, more, in increasingly. But on top of writing and taking notes, um, our book recommends another strategy, which is let me see if I can get it over here. Um, they don't have it. I don't know why they don't have it on here. But anyway, in the book, it's called Reflection. Reflection. Reflecting. And these all kind of go under this rubric of reflection. So you're not just um, taking notes, but you actually set aside a time in which you go back. This is the same question you're asking. Do you ever go back and reread them? You need a, a time when you go back and reread your notes. And you think through, okay, what did I hear? Um, you may not do that with a physical notes. You may do it with your mental notes, right? You may sit quietly and rethink back through a conversation that you just had. You may think back through the impressions that, that came to your mind as you were meeting this person and what they did, what connections you made. So going back to the Rolodex um, picture, and the LinkedIn picture, um, whenever I was in multi-level marketing, yeah, don't ask. Um, that's kind of some memories that I try to block out. <laughs> but um, whenever I was doing that, um, I learned a system called the notebook system. And basically, you take a notebook and you start writing down everybody that you know. Kind of like the same thing as Rolodex. But by physically writing down their name, Whenever you write that person's name down, it makes you think of three other people that you hadn't thought of before. 
that, that, that are connected with that person. So you write their names down. And then those people make you think of others. And you start filling notebooks. And you'd be amazed at how many people you actually know. Now, um, a person like me, I feel somewhat overwhelmed because I have lived so many different places. Our family has moved so many times. I don't know if any of y'all are like military brats or, or anything like that. And you know the experience of moving from one place to another and you're constantly learning a new set of people and a new set of friends and new connections. And, and, and then when you're my age and you have all these connections and you feel so overwhelmed because you can't actually keep up with them nearly well enough, right? So you get on Facebook and you post every now and then and you like all, you know, all 3,500 of them or whatever. Um, but there's no way to have, you know, how do you actually have a relationship with these people? And I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that. But part of what I'm saying is we have to have, we have to figure out some way of valuing the people that we know of staying in contact, of listening, or at least, you know, have a defined group that we that we choose and that we intentionally stay in touch with, right? Um, that, that that's that's very important. And open ourselves up to learn to meet new people. Um, I, it it's painful sometimes. Um, it's hard, but it's worth it in the end. You know, as we as we learn to serve others, as we learn to excel in communication, um, as we learn to network. So I have a, a LinkedIn profile, and that's one of the things that we're going to work on as well on Wednesday. I need y'all, as you're building your resume, as you're building your CV, uh, your curriculum vita. Um, go ahead and put that information into a LinkedIn profile, all right? Um, because that's like a, a static CV that's open there for all the world to see. And I've gotten, I've gotten work that way just passively without ever tr even trying to sometimes. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth connecting in, in that way. They use uh, things like supercharging your notes. Um, you know, I know for those people who do debate and have to take uh, lots of notes really fast, they'll have like shorthand. And um, uh, I know Omar was talking about he has a, a post-it note, a color system with his post-it notes in which he um, highlights different kinds of information under different colors. And I think that's really important. That's really good. Supercharged. Some people of y'all have seen um, uh, the, what do you call it? The point journals, the bullet journals. Yeah. And I got into that um, really heavy a few, a couple years ago, and I still do it off and on, not to the same level. But, but I think it's really valuable if you can... It, obviously, all of these strategies are something that you have to take personally and adapt and build it to, into a useful habit for yourself, right? They don't just fall into your lap pre-cut. They don't just fall into your lap ready-made, but they're the beginnings of ideas that, just like any other exercise, you have to work into your own self and into your own ability to to use them. You have to exercise them, right? They have to become part of your um, part of your exercise, part of your habitual muscle memory. Um, and so, listening, um, having these structures in which you look at people, you write notes, you t you have time to reflect on them, you have a filing system. There you go. Um, if you have, if you're keeping notes, it's really important that you have something to do with those notes, right? Whether you keep notebooks 
or whether you have a filing system where you can take. So um, let me use a, a couple of examples here for y'all. Um, one of my favorite programs that, that has re revolutionized my life is Evernote. Uh, um, because it is across medias, across many different kinds of media. Now, I'm not saying this is the only one. Uh, there are a lot of other ones. There's OneNote, you know, or there's a Apple Notes in Apple or, or whatever, where you can do kind of the same things. And I've never spent the money on the, the premium version of Evernote, so that kind of limits how many notes I can take each month, which maybe I should have invested. But the cool thing about um, Evernote is that you can build these notebooks of ideas. And so, I mean, I have every different kind of uh, notebook. You know, anytime I have two different notes that have the same type of topic, then I build another notebook. And you can have the same note in three different notebooks if you want to, right? Because they cross apply. I have a, no a notebook on philosophy. The difference between persuading people and oppressing them. How do you change people's mind without breaking their free will? Um, Arthur Eddington, the physics, uh, quantum theory. Um, anyway, so if I'm going to make a new note, this note could take several different ways. It could be um, a to-do list, right? It could be notes from, uh, you know, typed notes. Um, my my last my this my latest phone that I got has this cute little stylus, and this has been my my dream come true. Um, and actually, Evernote allows you to write handwritten notes in it, so I can use my stylus to write handwritten notes. Um, I can also record like audio recordings or video recordings and post them into a notebook. So whenever I'm driving and I need hands free, right, I can just um, switch on my audio and I can start taking notes. And the cool thing about right, Google these days is you can actually, it'll actually take dictation and it'll transfer what you say directly into, into typed notes. Um, uh, so, They have some new, um, some new, uh, what do you call it? Templates that I haven't used yet. So you can you can choose what you want or or minimize and take away these templates if you don't like them. A weekly planner. Um, you can have pictures. You can especially you can have um, like if I'm scrolling and noting things down on on internet um, it has what they call a web clipper so I can highlight something I can be re uh, researching something um, and highlight it and clip up here and uh, basically whenever it says share it just um, automatically shares it directly into my Evernote notebook So definitely a, a, a worthwhile method of preserving your ideas and organizing them. Then you have to have um, a sense of urgency for response. All right? If you've got, if you've got notes, you need to be sure to write back. Right, respond to people who reach out to you. Connect with people. Intentionally write write letters. If it's email or text message or direct message in Facebook or whatever it is, intentionally connect with your with your people. Right. So write them personal, direct, intentional communication, so that you are 
letting them know you're giving that feedback that yes, you are listening to them, that they are important to you, and that um, um, and through that you're building this community, right? You're building this ability to to um, interact and understand each other. All right. Well, we're almost out of time. It's already five o'clock. Um, is there anything else that y'all had? Any questions that y'all had about what we're doing this week? So next week, I'll, I'll give you some pointers. But basically, I'm wanting to see y'all, you know, I'm going to physically be setting aside time where you're typing in, you're building a profile on LinkedIn. You're writing your resume, you're processing through the kinds of experiences that you've had, and we're going to talk about how to sell yourself, how to tell your story that's accurate, that is um, also appropriate. Um, and I keep forgetting that, but Grice's Maxims. Let me do that really quick while I'm thinking about it. Um, Grice's Maxims. This is super important. Um, we've seen it already. Let me see. But um, there's a, a, a philosopher named John Grice that, um, that set out kind of um, a philosophical view of, of how communication should happen. Grace's maxims. This is not, this is the long, let me go back. Here they are. All right, so there's four maxims about communication. One is the maxim of quantity. The maxim of quantity says that one tries to be as informative as possible and give as much information as needed and no more. All right? As informative as possible. So when we are in a dialogue with people, when we're in a community, in communication, we want to give as much information, much important pertinent information as possible and no more. The second one is the maxim of quality, where we assume that the people that we talk to and we assume that we are what you call um, good faith communicators, right? We are going to be as truthful as possible. We don't give information that is false or that has no supporting evidence or that is intended to mislead, right? So um, now we all know that this does happen and, it, and, it, and it's not necessarily like this, but this is kind of the ideal of communication. This is the, this is the format that we would like to see in communication, both for ourselves and the people that we speak with. The third one is the maximum of relation. One tries to be as relevant, right, or shall we say appropriate, that the things that we are discussing pertain to the topic at hand, pertain to our project that we're working on together, pertain to our, um, our interaction or the community in which we exist. We're not just throwing out random things that have nothing to do with anything. And the third one is the maxim of manner, where one tries to be as clear, as brief, and as orderly as one can in what one says and where one avoids the obscurity and ambiguity. Now, this is, um, you know, this is assuming that communication is two people working together towards a common goal of communication, right? Where both of us, our, our common goal, our, seeing, our, 
are synergistically attempting to provide a win-win scenario in which both sides are pleased with our communication and both sides get what we want, which is information and clarity, right? So with those being the assumptions, these maxims are really important, right? Now, obviously, like I said, you may think of examples where this doesn't apply, but um, in listening, this is what we should be striving for, right? Listen for clarity. Listen for um, brevity. Listen for orderliness. Um, as maxims stand, there may be an overlap as regards to length of what one says between the maxims of quantity and manner. Um, if the speaker gives the five required units of information but is either too curt or too long-winded in conveying them to the listeners, then the maximum of manner is broken. The dividing line, however, may be rather thin or unclear. There are times when we may say that both the maxims of quantity and quality are broken by the same factors. So um, we'll, we'll develop this more on Thursday. But I wanted to kind of leave it with you where in your storytelling of yourselves for the purpose of getting work, um, these are kind of the assumptions that we're going to be working from. Wednesday. Wednesday. 345. AAB 102. Or 350. Depending on hopefully making it here right after uh, high school. Thank you all so much. Um, I'll hang out for a minute.